Outcome measures like risk ratios, odds ratios and hazard ratios are frequently used in health economics and public health research. Yet they're often confused and misinterpreted. That's why in today's video I will walk you through a simple example to highlight the differences among these three ratios, giving you the confidence so that you can interpret and apply these different concepts appropriately. Let's assume we've conducted a study in which 100 patients have received a new treatment. To test if the new treatment is better, we've got a second group of 100 patients who've received the standard of care. This is our control group. What we want to know is if the new treatment improves patient's mortality. To answer this question, we can use either of the three ratios, so let's break it down. I'm going to start with the risk ratio, which is also referred to as the relative risk. The relative risk or risk ratio is a measure used to compare the risk of an event happening in one group to the risk of it happening in another group. So what do we mean by risk? Risk is simply a different term for probability and is therefore a number between zero and one. We can calculate the risk in a group by dividing the number of events in a group by the total number in a group. Let's look at our example to understand this a little bit better. After one year, we observe that 69 out of the 100 patients in our intervention group have died. So the risk of death is 69 over 100, 69% or 0.69. In our control group, 90 patients have died. So the risk of death for patients who've received standard of care is 90 over 100, 90% or 0.9. The risk ratio simply compares these two risks by expressing the risk in the intervention group relative to the risk in the control group, calculated as the risk in the intervention group divided by the risk in the control group. This means we divide 0.69 by 0.9, resulting in a risk ratio of 0.77. Since this value is less than one, it indicates that our new intervention reduces the risk of death compared to the standard of care. In other words, patients in the intervention group have a lower risk of dying than those not exposed to the new treatment. To be precise, we can say that the new intervention reduces the risk of death by 23% compared to the standard of care. On the other hand, if our new drug were less effective than the standard of care, the risk ratio would be greater than one. For example, if the new treatment resulted in a higher risk of death, say 95% compared to the 90% in the standard of care group, the risk ratio would be 0.95 divided by 0.9 equaling 1.055. In this scenario, our intervention increases the risk of death by 5.5%. If the risks in the exposure and control groups were identical, say both at 90%, the risk ratio would equal one, indicating no difference between the two treatments. Next, let's talk about odds ratios. Now, odds might feel a little bit less intuitive than risks, but don't worry, they're not too tricky, I promise. So what are odds? Well, odds are simply the probability that an event will occur, divided by the probability that an event will not occur. Let's go back to our example from earlier. For the patients who received the new treatment, the odds of death are 69 over 31, which comes out to 2.22. 69 patients had the outcome and 31 patients did not. So patients in the new treatment group are actually more likely to die than they are to survive. Now, here's the key difference between risk and odds. For risks, the denominator is the total number of patients at risk at the start. But for odds, the denominator is the number of patients who didn't experience the event. So while the numerator is the same for both, the denominator is where they differ. You'll also notice that the difference between risks and odds becomes more pronounced when the event is common. So for example, with 69 out of 100 deaths, the difference between risks and odds is pretty big. But if fewer people died, say just two out of 100, the risk and odds would look almost the same. Now that we understand the difference between risks and odds, let's calculate our odds ratio. To do that, we're dividing the odds in our exposure group by the odds in our control group. We've already calculated the odds for our exposure group to be 2.22, and we know that for standard of care, 90 patients had an event, whereas 10 did not have an event. So our odds for the control group are 90 over 10, which equals 9. Therefore, our odds ratio is 
divided by 9, which equals 0 0.25. The interpretation for the odds ratio is the same as for the risk ratio, whereby an odds ratio smaller than 1 indicates that the new drug decreases the odds of death, an odds ratio larger than 1 would indicate it increases the odds of death, and an odds ratio of 1 would indicate no difference. Moving on to our last ratio for today, the hazard ratio is probably the least intuitive measure out of the entire bunch. Let me explain how the hazard ratio differs from the other two outcomes. Risk ratios and odds ratios assess the effect of an exposure or treatment or an outcome at a fixed point in time. For example, in our study, we assessed patients after one year. However, what if we had decided to assess the effectiveness of a new drug after three years instead? In this case, we might obtain a different risk and odds ratio, and therefore our conclusions could be different. Hazard ratios address exactly this issue. Rather than comparing the risk or odds in the exposure and control group at a particular point in time, hazard ratios compare the hazard, which is the instantaneous rate of an event occurring. In our case, the hazard is the rate of death per unit of time for patients in each treatment group, given that they have survived up until that time. That's why hazard ratios are in tandem with survivorship curves, which show the temporal progression of an event within a group, whereby the event in our example is death. To illustrate this, consider these plots, which show the percentage of patients surviving in the exposure group in blue and those in our control group in red. For the sake of simplicity, let's assume that the hazard in both groups is constant over time. To understand the hazard, imagine you're a patient in the new treatment group and you ask yourself, given I've survived up until now, what's the probability I'll die within the next month? Let's say the hazard of dying in the new treatment group is 0.1 and the hazard of dying in the standard of care group is 0.2. With this information, we can then calculate the ratio of these two hazards, so 0.1 divided by 0.2, which gives us a hazard ratio of 0.5. This means that the hazard of death for patients on the new drug is 50% of the hazard for those on standard of care treatment. So they're 50% less likely to die, given that they've already survived up until that point. If the hazard ratio were 0.7 instead, it would mean that the new treatment reduces the hazard of death by 30%, or in other words, patients in the new treatment group have a 30% lower risk of dying at any given time during the study. Last, if we had a hazard ratio of 1, the Kaplan-Meier curse for both groups would perfectly overlap, indicating that there is no difference in the risk of death between the new treatment and the standard of care over time. In practice, we may of course still see cases where the hazard ratio is 1, even though the Kaplan-Meier curves don't overlap perfectly. This can be attributed to non-proportional hazards, which means that the hazard ratio between the two groups does not remain constant over time. Now that you understand the differences among these three ratios, you might be curious about how to use hazard ratios to model treatment effects in a Markov cohort simulation. In fact, I've just released a video where I walk you through the entire process of comparing two oncology drugs. So be sure to check that one out next.